Greetings, I'm John Duvall. Welcome back to another Truth Factor discussion. We did take last week off due to the holidays, but we're back and we're picking up in John chapter 7, verse 1. You know, we've really spent the last two weeks separating the wheat from the chaff, and all that's left is Brian and John. So, Tom got blown away on a trip somewhere, and Brendan is out in the wind, and Paul, there's no telling where Paul's at today, and Bob, so. <laughs> so, you get to look at two entirely different looking people. But the most handsome, either way. Not the most handsome? Is that what you said? No, I said definitely the most handsome. Oh, yeah, definitely the most, the most handsome, handsome, too. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> All right, let's see. I want to see if there's anything else we needed to cover real quick. Danielle's joined us today. We have Jimmy. He's joined us also. David is with us, too. And if this is the first time that you have popped into our study, we want to thank you for your interest in these things. If you have a question or comment during the course of our study today, please feel free to share those with us. You can always use the comment section that's connected with this live stream on our Facebook page or use the chat area connected with the live stream on our YouTube page. And both of those uh, social media identifications are at Truth Factor Live. You see on the screen there, email address. You can also send us an email, send any questions at truthfactorlive.com. We'd love to hear from you and to know what you have to think about these things. All right, Brian, we're picking up in John chapter seven, verse one. Um, we were talking just a moment beforehand. Is there anything that you'd like to share in regards to um, as, as we get into this chapter or draw to our yeah. attention? Well, John, I, I, one of the things that I think is really interesting is that John has a very uh, unique way of approaching the life of Jesus. And we've talked about this a lot already, so I hate to uh, keep talking about it. But I do think it's interesting that in the book of John, there are seven I am statements. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. Um, there are seven specific miracles that Jesus performs that are, you know, our attention is brought to. Um, and there, and, and in this chapter, we're about to see two things that come up. One of them is there are seven feasts that Jesus participates in. Uh, typically, we point to three Passovers and four other feasts, a couple unnamed feasts. Uh, and this chapter, we're going to come to the Feast of Tabernacles, a very important feast. It was one of the convocation feasts that the Jews were required to go to Jerusalem, the Jewish men were required to appear in Jerusalem for. So, uh, so this feast comes up here. As well, there's also going to be at verse 6, <clears throat> another one of Jesus's seven time statements. I don't know how to describe that other than I call them the timeliness statements that Jesus says in the book of John seven times about the time coming. Um, he'll say, I believe it's four times he says, my time has not yet come. And then three times it'll say his time has come. Um, and those time statements are meant for us to get a very specific feeling about the idea that uh, everything is going according to a plan. That in other words, it isn't as though Jesus just showed up and oh, surprise, they killed him. That everything happens according to the timing that Jesus is setting up. And that's that's a really important idea that gets uh, brought up repeatedly in the scriptures. Jesus doesn't die because he loses to his enemies. Jesus dies because that is his plan. And he has established the time for that to happen. Okay. You know, what's interesting, there we go, is... Um, there were three feasts during the course of the year that required the, the men to travel to Jerusalem. Um, the first one would have been the, the Passover feast. And the second one would have been Pentecost 50 days later. This one you're talking about, the Feast of Tabernacles, are also called the Feast of Tents. This one was held in the fall, wasn't it, if memory serves? I believe you're correct, yes. Yeah. And, and this, that's where they would go to... Oh, go ahead. No, 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 keep going. You're, in, you're heading where I was heading. I was just going to say, this is a feast where it, it came right before the time of atonement and they would come to Jerusalem and kind of to reenact living in the wilderness, you would have to live in a, we call it the Feast of Tents or Booths is also another one that you see sometimes. And you would build a, a booth or a tent that you would then, you know, in some way live in for a period of time to kind of reenact the time that the Israelites spent in the wilderness. And it also prepared them for the coming of the Day of Atonement. So this feast is leading into the Day of Atonement, which really wasn't a convocation moment. It was more of the time that the high priest uh, performed his yeah. 
uh, according to the book of Hebrews, probably his most sacred duty, and that was to make atonement for Israel. Okay. All right. All right. Good. Good point. You know, it's it's interesting or intriguing, maybe, maybe not intriguing. Anyway, that w under the new covenant of Christ, all these feast days were never authorized by Christ. You know, we don't we meet together on the first day of the week to proclaim the primary object, not object of our worship, but the reason behind our worship, the death of Christ upon the cross of Calvary. Um, but, but for them, these were given to them as a continual reminder and they needed it. Just kind of look at their history there. Yeah. It's kind of interesting, uh, John, and I, I know we don't want to go too far into this, but it seems to indicate in the old Testament, they were really bad about keeping these feast days. I mean, there's a couple of times where you have a feast day and then you have the next time they do it like over a century later kind of thing, you know, several times yeah. it talks about the feast days and it was like in the time of Hezekiah, they said, Hey, I hadn't done this before, you know, and. Um, you know, they're, that they're really bad about observing these feast days. And, you know, the second thing I want to point out, too, that I think is kind of interesting, and you touched on it, so I'm going to use that as my authority sure. to go on. Uh, we, <laughs> we have a feast day, as you said. We have the first day of the week. That is our feast day, and it's a feast of commemoration, just like many of their feasts were. What's kind of neat to notice is, and this is why studying the Old Testament is valuable to us, is that all of their feasts kind of there are elements of all of those feasts brought in to our feast day you know the uh whether it's concepts of atonement we're celebrating our atonement uh the unleavened bread that we're partaking of um the idea of dwelling in a tabernacle that we're living in a tent until the return of jesus first corinthians 11 says that the lord's supper proclaims that um there's a lot of elements in the lord's supper that you can go backwards and look at these seven feasts that they had in the old or I'm, I'm sorry not seven feasts but the feasts that they had in the old testament that you can see those uh elements from those feast days that are brought into our feast uh day and so i've i've always enjoyed that that's kind of a fun study if somebody wants to say hey i'm gonna i'm gonna look at that look at those old testament feast days and think about the elements of them and then think about how that contrasts to our feast day, the true feast day, um, the the one we celebrate in Christ. That's a good point. Um, two two things real quick. I'm, we're going to be starting, Lord willing, this Sunday uh, foundation building study, and I'm going to try to look at not not truly you know, not go back and take it book by book, but look at key events. You know, think about the sin of man and everything. And in the course of this, we're going to talk about God's covenant with Israel. Well, I think that information is important for the very reason you're talking about, because of the shadowing of something better to come and to kind of appreciate why we do what we do in the Lord's Supper, what foreshadowed that, you know. Um, other thing is, I think I counted only six times in the Old Testament they observed the Passover as far as what was recorded, wow. you know. Um, you, you'll see it a couple of times, I think maybe two years after they leave Egypt, there's a time and then... There's a, and then jump forward to Hezekiah, and I can't remember, maybe under Josiah. Josiah was the other one, you're right, yes. All right, I'm going to have to change things here for just a minute, because the, the way I hear Brian is gone. So, uh -oh. <laughs> my blue maybe no one can hear decided me. to die on me for just a minute. Give me just a moment, let me process this. Um, Brian, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, have you to go ahead and can't hear you though go ahead and read uh the first nine verses and just go ahead and take the study i won't try to bring it up on the screen for the simple reason i can't hear you hopefully in the next five minutes i'll have the problem solved and be right back and i think i know everyone else can hear me so i'll start reading um we're in john chapter seven so i'm gonna i'm gonna use hand signals to help john john chapter seven verse one and so i'm going to read john chapter seven verse one and I'm going to read up through verse 9. So we're going to do John chapter 7, verses 1 through 9. And uh, something kind of interesting happens here. So beginning in John chapter 7, verse 1. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee. For he did not want to walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea that your disciples may also see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. 
Then Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come. Your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. You go up to this feast. I am not yet going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. When Jesus said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. And so I finished up the reading there. I'm going to send John a little note to let him know that. Um, and then it's kind of interesting to think of uh, you all hear me, but John does not. But uh, we have completed that. So, uh, And it is interesting as we're considering uh, these verses, that, of course, the very first thing that pops up to us is that Jesus's brothers do not believe in him. And I've always found that a very interesting thing. I'd love to hear some comments about that, by the way. Uh, what do you think about that? Jesus's brothers, people you might say know him best, don't believe in him. What does that mean? You know, there's a, there's a passage in Mark where it talks about that they uh, even tried to restrain him on occasion. And I'd be curious to hear what your comments are about why Jesus's brothers do not believe him. And I'd also like to hear about this conundrum that comes up here that Jesus says, I'm not yet going to the feast, and we haven't read this yet, but in verse 10, what happens? And I think that's a very interesting point to consider, too. So I'd love to hear some comments on that, and we can bring those in if you can uh, make those comments. Um, but uh, we will, uh, like I said, uh, I'll see if I can get John's attention to let him know uh, that we have read through verse 9. So uh, John may not be able to hear me still. See John nodding, so he knows. Well, uh, then what we will continue then to do, I'll, I'll, I'll actually just continue to, to talk about this chapter. Um, of course, we've already mentioned what the purpose of the Feast of Tabernacles was, um, and it was a requirement to go. And one of the interesting things that Jesus uh, reveals to us, particularly in the book of John, is that Jesus kept the old law faithfully. You know, one thing that I often like to point out about Jesus growing up, uh, we, of course, you might remember that Jesus was up there for a feast day when he was 12 years old, is that he had to have a particularly faithful family, uh, parents, a mother and father who were faithful, in order that he would complete the law as required by God. In other words, um, you know, when he was a baby, he had little power to get himself to those feast days or things like that, so he was necessarily obligated to rely on the faithfulness of his parents. And I've often pointed out that that kind of reflects on the idea that Jesus, uh, that God selecting the parents, the people that would be the father, the physical father and the physical mother for Jesus on this earth, uh, had to pick people that would be dutiful in executing the law of Moses. Uh, because for many years, Jesus is not going to be able to perform those things all by himself because of the restraints of the physical age and such. So Jesus, always keeping those feast days, sometimes had to rely on other people, his family, to do so. See a couple of comments that are said here, and I, I'm really grateful for those. Uh, first of all, Caleb Davis says, No honor in your hometown, and it would appear in your family home growing up. Very interesting. Uh, yeah, Caleb, it is very interesting. It is interesting that that kind of demonstrates the idea that Jesus, you know, it's not as though they could look at Jesus and say, Well, we knew you when you were younger and you were a rascal. They, I mean, they're not going to say that. They're not going to point to Jesus's failings that they personally observe. They're just going to say that because we know you, it seems unlikely or impossible that you are who you claim to be. And that's that seems to be the point here. Verse 4, reveal yourself to the world. If you are who you say you are, reveal yourself to the world. So this lack of honor or respect is probably because of familiarity. We have a saying, familiarity breeds contempt. And the idea is that if we're very close to something, we don't recognize its significance sometimes. So, Caleb, I, I, you're actually quoting those other statements that are made in Matthew and Mark about this, and I really appreciate that. Breaker Hinckley says uh, that, talking about his brothers, they saw the miracles, I'm sure, but older brother or not, he couldn't be the son of God since I grew up with him. He's a prophet. Um, Gregor, I think that's a great point. Jesus is the oldest brother, and we've talked about this a little bit before. The Bible names four brothers uh, of Jesus, and then it says he had sisters, plural. So he had at least six siblings younger than him. So Jesus is the oldest uh, of a total of seven children at least. 
Um, and they grew up with him. And, and I've often wondered, you know, Jesus being the oldest brother, he took care of them. He watched them, you know, that they, they had a relationship with him that was very uh, natural. And, and as Gregor says, if Jesus starts telling people he's the son of God, they're going to be a little bit bothered by that saying, we know who you are. We, you know, we know, you, we know dad, you know, who's probably deceased at this time. So it's interesting that they would think this way. Um, now, Caleb goes on to say, of course, James, his brother, becomes an apostle. Uh, James probably means prophet. Uh, James, uh, Jesus, his brother, uh, is identified as James, the writer of the book of James, as well as James, one of the elders uh, in Israel. Now, James, the apostle, there's actually two James, the apostle, um, that James, the apostle, is not the same as James, the brother of Jesus. Isn't that confusing? There are three Jameses in the Bible. Um, by the way, I'm going to make this even more confusing. Uh uh, James is a language translation to a different name. The name is actually Jacob. Uh, the name James in New Testament is actually the name Jacob. Uh, in Greek, it's Jacobus. So it's kind of interesting uh, that we consider this. The idea that Jesus' uh, brother, James, uh, is the one that later becomes one of his devoted followers, who's very well respected. So, uh, you know, it's interesting that they will become believers, as Caleb is pointing out. James and Jude, who wrote the book of Jude, is also one of Jesus' uh, brothers, or I guess more accurately, one of his half-brothers. Um, but the idea is that they will believe in him. Um, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that Jesus uh, particularly appeared to uh, uh, James later on that whenever Jesus was resurrected that he made a particular appearance to James. So that's kind of an important thing. Um, uh, so Caleb makes the point to say, James, the Lord's brother is called uh, an apostle by Paul, right? Well, that's a good question, Caleb. Um, in Galatians chapter two, it talks about Paul meeting James. And I don't recall if he uses that term, maybe he does. Now he's not one of the 12 for sure, of course, because he wasn't a believer in Jesus until he was raised. Now, that term apostle sometimes gets used a little generically. Like at the end of the book of Romans, I think there's three or four people that are that are called apostle. And apostle just means somebody who's been sent. Um, now, James was never actually sent anywhere, too. What's interesting is James stayed all of his life in Jerusalem, as far as we understand. And he died in Jerusalem, according to uh, secular history. So, you know, I, um, I don't know that he was actually ever sent anywhere. He's one of the elders of the church in Jerusalem, and he's called a pillar uh, of that church. And I, as I said, I believe that's in Galatians chapter 2, Caleb. So, um, uh, and I'm kind of uh, reading, and this is in James chapter, Galatians chapter 2 and verse 9, where he calls him one of the pillars of the congregation. Um, but I don't recall, like I said, if he was actually ever talked about as an apostle. But it is an interesting uh, expression, an idea. Uh, Bob, it's good to have you on board with us this morning. We're a little, uh, we're a little short, and we're having a technical difficulty. Bob, uh, John's audio has gone out, so he can't hear what we are saying. Uh, of course, that gives you the and I the opportunity to say terrible things about him while he can't hear us. But uh, we're just trying to kind of uh, work through John chapter seven verses one through nine while while John fixes this audio. So we're in John chapter seven verses one through nine. Go ahead, Bob. Well, just between uh, you and me and the audience, I, I really despise John. Yeah, uh, yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> John's a good, I tell you, in my old age, I got my wires crossed about which program had been discontinued for the month of July. It's my uh -huh. study on Tuesday. And so I, I came in late because I just discovered that you were going to be on afterward. Uh, but... Uh, I want to say this about Peter, uh, about James being an apostle. Uh, in Galatians chapter uh, one, verse nineteen, but I saw none of the uh, none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. I don't believe that that implies that James, the Lord's brother, was an apostle. Uh, in Luke, and I'm not sure about the reference now. You might can find it pretty pretty quick. Uh, in Luke, Jesus refers to the widow of Narathath, Zarephath. And he said, but but none of, uh, uh, Elijah was sent to none of the widows of Zarephath, uh, or the widows in Israel, except Zarephath. Well, that doesn't mean Zarephath was a part of Israel. But it just means that he wasn't sent to any of the ones in Israel, but he was sent to the widow of Zarephath. And so I think that's the sense in which except here is, is used. He didn't say any of the other 
apostles, although he did see James the Lord's brother. And I think this is the only only reference I've ever seen used to assert that uh, that James the Lord's brother was an apostle. Uh, I, I believe you're right about the uh, familiarity thing. Uh, keep in mind that Jesus was older than all of his uh, half-brothers and uh, his half-sisters, uh, being the firstborn. And so uh, they, had to, they had to have looked up to him uh, being an, an older man. They had to notice that uh, he wasn't into foolishness like the other young, young people. Uh, but, it, you know, it was just hard for them to, uh, impossible perhaps even, to conceive that their brother, their half brother, could be the Messiah, uh, and I, I don't know. They would have to discount their mother's story about the virgin birth, and maybe they found that impossible to believe and assumed or jumped to the conclusion that uh, Mary and Joseph or Mary and someone had had uh, relations before Jesus was born. Uh, but it's it's under, almost understandable that they would not believe uh, that Jesus was a Christ. But after the resurrection, uh, there were no doubts because in Acts chapter 1, uh, his brothers are mentioned along with the 120 disciples uh, who were gathered there uh, in Jerusalem uh, at the time that... Uh, Judas Iscariot's office, which he had vacated due to his sin, was uh, fulfilled or filled by Matthias. And, uh, and so they are brethren at that point. But it took the resurrection. Paul mentions that he appeared to James after the resurrection. That James is almost certainly the brother of, the brother of Jesus. Uh, because... Uh, James, the brother of John, of course, was killed in Acts 12. Uh, the other James is hardly mentioned at all, if at all, in the, in, the, uh, in the book of Acts. Very few of the apostles are mentioned by name in the book of Acts. After Acts chapter 1, we've got Peter and John in Acts chapter 3. We've got James in Acts chapter 12. But again, that was uh, when he was put to death by Herod. So... Uh, and and the the gospel of or the book the epistles of James and Jude at the end almost certainly written by half brothers of Jesus if they were James and John the apostle uh, they would have or James and Jude the apostles they would have indicated that to have uh, increased their uh, their veracity. You know you know Bob something I find very interesting is that when James talked starts his letter off in the book of James. He doesn't say James, Jesus's brother. He says right. James, Jesus's servant. Um, yeah. And I've always thought what is so neat. And Jude, when he starts his letter, he doesn't say Jude, Jesus's brother. He says Jude, James's <laughs> brother. Yeah. Um, and what I think is always so critical is none of these brothers said, you know, especially after the resurrection, well, wait a second, I'm his brother. So that should count. You know, you think of what was it? Billy Carter, you know, Hey, I'm the president's brother, you know, Jimmy Carter's brother. You ought to pay attention to me. Um, Jesus's brothers never, they, they stood on their own credibility. I mean, they were incredible men on their own later, um, but they never tried to get into that. And I, I've always pointed out one of the really remarkable things about the way of Christ is that when Jesus dies and his, you know, and then returns and then he gives his movement to his followers, there's not an infighting of the family versus the devout ones. Now I say that to say in other religions, that is the case. Islam, for example. When, when Muhammad dies, Islam immediately splits into two factions. The family faction that said, well, his family should be the rulers, and the followers faction, which said his devout followers should be the facts. That's the Sunni and Muslims that we have today. They split over that. It, it, the, the, the Mormon church split immediately after Joseph Smith died between his family and Brigham Young. And, and, and so often we see that in worldly religions. But in the true religion... It was, they were completely unified. They were all one. And there was never a sense of, well, you know, I was his brother or I was his most important follower. They're all said, no, I'm just his servant. Even the, uh, the Grecian kingdom, uh, Macedonian kingdom was broken up after, right. after the great died because he divided 
he personally, I, I, I guess, divided up his kingdom among his four yeah. uh, generals. And, and the idea was he wanted them to give it to his son, and then they killed his son So uh, 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 through his wife, Roxanne. So it's interesting that there would have been a little family friction, but the four generals said, well, we can settle that, and they they, they took his family's But life. that broke the kingdom up and left, uh, left the door open for the Maccabees. <laughs> Yeah, right, and, right. Uh, their revolt and uh and of course the the roman empire later yeah. we got a couple of comments bob that i'm going to bring in daniel makes a uh, danielle sorry danielle makes the comment uh that people you are the closest to are sometimes our worst critics i mean by the way daniel one thing i think about that statement and and it kind of goes back to what caleb had said too about you know the prophet has no honor is sometimes the people that it is the most difficult to, to bring to convert are people that know you best. And it's and again, it's not even necessarily because, well, they saw me at my worst. It's just that they there's a familiarity that feels like I don't have to listen, it seems. And so, Daniel, I think you're bringing up a really great point there. We also have a, a question from David. I'm gonna Bob's gonna answer this because Bob has the answer on this, I'm sure. Okay. The question is, do we know the ages of his half-brothers and sisters? Uh, Bob, how would you answer that? Well, we know that the oldest one was uh, uh, at least nine months younger than Jesus. <laughs> uh, other than that, we don't know what how, how they were spaced out. Uh, yeah. Your audio is working now, John. Yeah, he and he can't hear us to, for us to tell him this, so... Okay. <laughs> So he doesn't know he's broadcasting over us. So yeah, he yeah. Needs to, he's gonna, he's and, I, and we can't mute him because he's the host of the show. So he's designed a, it so we can't mute the host. What about a a, a note? Yeah, uh, it sounds like maybe he figured it out and cut it. So okay. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So that's a good point. Uh, so we, you know, we don't know. We know that there were. I mean, the Catholic Church position is that Mary remained a virgin throughout her life, and uh they uh elevated her to god uh demi god uh, if you will status so bob how there's an answer to this uh and i don't know if you know it or not how does the catholic church then overcome jesus having brothers and sisters what they, what do the catholics say, say about that, that that brothers there simply means spiritual brothers okay that is what i have said in debates and and in the literature that i've read I'm going to let John know that we're getting his audio in. Okay. Um, so, so anyway, one other thing the Catholic Church often says is they say, well, John, well, uh, Joseph had been married before, and that that prior marriage he had uh, um, that he had had older children. So they try to make sometimes they've also said that these siblings are actually older than Jesus. But I've heard them say two cousins that they say cousins, spiritual brothers, as you said, they have a lot of. Uh, uh, a lot of ways they try to work around that when it's very clear that these are Jesus's siblings. Uh, and, one other point. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Bob. In, in that event, they would not be his half brothers. Yeah, that's right. That's and right. They will so, have no blood relationship to Jesus at all. That's if, right. If they are going to maintain the virginity of Mary, uh, because he was not yeah. the son of Joseph. Yeah. And so Jesus shared no parent with the, with them if that was the case. Yeah. And that's and that's exactly right. Um, you know, one other thing that I always like to add about Jesus's siblings is we know that James is later a, a, an elder in the church in Jerusalem, and we kind of get some timing off of that even. And in Paul, uh, Paul may be indicating in Galatians that 15 years after Jesus's death, James is one of the elders in Jerusalem. Um, that's that's one way we look at that passage passage um and and if even if we're not sure that's what G paul was saying uh, at least we kind of get a sense that it's probably about the time period well what i would like to say is sometimes people say well how old should an elder be uh and i often say well the only age we can speculate to in the bible is an age is is james and because he was younger than jesus he would have been younger than say you know 45 uh 48 years old so it's kind of interesting we can kind of put a kind of a quasi age on james as an elder because of this information so uh, i like that i like to think of that I'm not sure what passage would be used to say he was an elder. Uh, he certainly seems to have been an evangelist, which is the only, uh, the the biggest claim I've heard regarding uh, James. 
Uh, in Acts chapter 15, he's certainly listed among the leaders. Uh, mm -hmm. But I don't know that unless, 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 well, in that case, he's an apostle and an elder. If, if, uh, if Paul is saying in Galatians one, that he is an elder, uh, but I don't know. I don't know what passage would say he was an elder, uh, right off, the, right off the bat. Well, I, and I think usually what it is, is it's usually Acts 15 that we point to because Acts 15 was a council between the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem. And since we're saying James was not an apostle, he would have fit into the category of one of the elders. Um, and this, uh, it also is a lot of the, uh, the, the secular history also labels him as one of the elders in Jerusalem as well. Um, so a lot of times what the, what the assumption is, is that since we would say he's not an apostle, uh, he's one of the elders at the church in Jerusalem. Since the council there, this uh, coming together, the apostles and elders, um, the, you know, we see that several times there in Acts chapter 15. And since James wouldn't have been one of the apostles, it's usually assumed he's one of the elders. And so this is the uh, what I've read many commentators make the point about, um, and it makes sense to me. Uh, verse 6 of Acts 15 talks about it being the apostles and elders that came together about this. And, then, and since we see James being one of the spokesmen of the group, it's usually, you know, kind of drawn that way. And again, that's kind of an inference. And I would, I would say maybe not, not quite a necessary inference, but it's an inference, if not a strong inference, perhaps. So maybe it's not proven. Strong presumptive evidence. <laughs> yeah, maybe that would be the way to put it. So um, that would be the way to put it there. Uh, I've and, always and of thought that he was certainly one of the leading men and would have been included in that. Just as I mean, Silas and and uh, Judas called Barsabbas uh, would have been there. They would have been privy to that information because they were sent by the elders to Antioch to accompany uh, Paul and Barnabas uh, with that letter yeah. uh, that they wrote. But uh, but that's that's possible, I guess. Yeah, I think Can't, Acts twenty one also. Um, gives us uh, some sense of that too, uh, where Paul, it says in verse 18, Paul went in to us to James and all the elders. Um, so it's kind of, again, that, that's another passage that, again, it might, it might not mean James is an elder, but it sounds like he's being included in that list of elders. And that's, that's Acts chapter 21, verse 18. But again, not necessarily a necessary inference, I would agree, but it might be a presumptive evidence. Yeah. Uh, James, and all the others yeah Not yeah the and it, yeah well and it uh, um yeah. you know and it could be you know like i said yeah. I, I guess that that could be but it seems like him being included in both lists might yeah. might make us think that and again and that's, that's we have some problem. secular testimony too i would not affirm otherwise yeah except um, as an expression of my personal opinion sure sure yeah no it's uh and like i said it's certainly not 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 a debatable point. I couldn't prove it one way or the other. But um, that gets us away from John chapter uh, 7. Uh, I'm not sure how much you had commented on that, how far through you had gotten. We had read through verse 9, and one of the things that we're going to bring up is a question here that uh, comes out of this, that Jesus tells his brothers, and, and Bob, I'll have you read. If you'll read verses um, 10 through 13 for a moment, and the big question is going to be, Jesus just told his brothers, uh, verse 8, you go to the feast, I'm not going to the feast, and then read to us what happens in verses 10 through 13, if you don't mind. All right. Reading from the New King James. But when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, where is he? And there was much complaining among the people concerning him. Some said he is good. Others said, no, on the contrary, he deceives the people. However, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. So those were all private conversations, apparently. Uh, but when he said, my time has not yet come, uh, I think he's talking there, not that he's not going to go and then goes. That would be a lie. Uh, but that He's not going to go openly. If he went with his family, that would be more open. So rather than go with his family, he goes up with his disciples uh, after his brothers had gone up. 
and uh, this way he could keep his he could keep a low profile. And so that's my thinking on on the contrast between verse uh, verse six and verse uh, thirteen, uh, verse ten. I like that comment a lot, Bob, and I like it a lot because your your first presumption would be correct to say. Um, you know, would be a necessary inference, we would say, because it can't be that Jesus is lying, you know, so so this conversation must be something a little different than than it first seems to us. Um, and what's interesting is this statement about my time. Now, Jesus will say four times, my time has not yet come, and then three times it'll be said his time had come, and it's referring to his death in those circumstances. So what's interesting is Jesus says my time, or in other words, the time for me to die has not yet come. He says your time could be any time. Um, and I, and I've always thought that's kind of interesting. Uh, you know, you, you, and I, maybe he's saying you could die anytime, but my time is it yet. Yeah, this isn't my time. But I think that that's the answer to what, as you've said there, that when he says my time is not yet come, what he's trying to tell us is that his time to die going out openly would get him killed or could potentially lead to him getting killed. So he's not going to go openly. That's really what they want him to do, not to go to the feast, but to go to the feast like he like he enters Jerusalem in the triumphal entry, you know, to, yeah. to go in this very blatant open way. And so what he's saying is not that he's not going to go. I think what he's saying is that he's not going to go the way uh, they're suggesting. I think that's verse eight. I'm not yet going up to this feast. I'm not yet going openly up to this feast because my time has not yet come. So they left and then he goes up secret, which is how he went, it seems, for most of the time since they're always trying to kill him. Now he'll pop up here in a couple of verses uh, verse 12, verse 14, in the middle of the feast, he's just going to walk into the temple and start talking. But it, but again, this idea of his showing up openly, I think, is the answer. I think you hit it right on the head, Paul. Yeah. And and uh, in, here in John chapter 7, there is an attempt to arrest him. Mm. Soldiers could not bring themselves to do that. That isn't that remarkable. Uh, it really is a great thing to say. Hey, we sent we sent the police to arrest this guy, and the police started listening, and they came back kind of wide eyed. Well, you're not going to believe the kind of things this guy was saying. You weren't supposed to listen to him. You're supposed to arrest him. Uh, and they'll get we, we're getting ahead of ourselves, but that's a really um, I almost laugh when I read that because it's almost funny to, to imagine we you're the tough guys. You were supposed to go arrest Jesus, and they come back and oh, we kidding yeah. the way he was talking. We couldn't do anything. Yeah, and I'm champing at the bit to make more comments on that, but I'll reserve myself. Yeah, hold on till we get there. Yeah, no, I agree. It's uh, There's a lot. Um, so uh, do we have any other comments there or anything else to bring up out of that, John or Bob, uh, verses 10 through 13? Um, I find verse 12 kind of interesting that people say, well, I think he's good, and others say, no, no, he's not. You've always heard the old adage, Jesus can't be a, just a good person that he either is a, a liar, uh, he's a madman, or he's more than good, he's everything. And I find it interesting that there's a little bit of that here. There are three three possibilities. He's Lord, he's a liar, or he's a lunatic. And they're not opting for the lunatic, but they are yeah. opting, some of them, for the deception. He's a liar. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so... The people are not united. Now, later, when he makes the triumphal entry, uh, there does seem to be a great deal of, uh, if not unity among all of them, at least a, a majority of the people uh, at that point accept him. And yet, less than a week later, they're calling for him to be crucified. And uh, so, yeah, I, th I think you're right about uh, your elaboration on my point that uh, if he goes publicly, yeah, that he will surely, he will surely die, and it's not time. Or at least, I guess I would say this, it's not so much that he would certainly die, but they would certainly try to kill him, and yeah. he doesn't want that to happen yet. I mean, Jesus can obviously escape that. At the end of, uh, they'll try in this chapter, and then in chapter 8, they're going to try to kill him, and they yeah. won't be able to do so. But I, Jesus just doesn't want that attention, it seems. He doesn't want them to do this yet. And and again in verse thirteen, no one spoke openly. These were private conversations among the people who knew one another. You know, we get a hint as to why that is in John nine that there's a statement been made by this by the rulers that if anybody declares Jesus openly, that that person is going to be um, 
uh, 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 excommunicated isn't the right word, but they're going to be put out of the synagogue. They're going to yeah. be ejected from their relationship. So it's kind of interesting that there has been this declaration of some kind that says anybody who declares Jesus to be the Christ, you know, you're out. You know, you're, you're so so that secret seems to be a reason. There's a reason for it. Yeah. In the day, I think we got John back. Yeah. Well, for how long? We'll see how long the battery lasts. In the day's time, they would they would be shadow banned. Oh, shadow banned. Yeah. Yeah. Or or, or or what? What is the term? Whenever they're suspended from their social media accounts, if they were to speak of right. Jesus openly, yeah. Cancel culture. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Began early. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, well, Brian, you're doing such a fabulous job. He is that's right. that's right. Let me bring in Jimmy uh, Kersey's comment. He just dropped one in real quick. It oh, was the Pharisees yeah, yeah. that tried to kill Jesus, right? Were there Pharisees that didn't want any part of killing Jesus? What Good a great point. question. Good question. Yeah. Uh, and, we, and we know one. And I'll bet Bob can tell us who it is that we know by name that was a Pharisee that didn't want to kill Jesus. Yeah, that was Nicodemus. Nicodemus, very good. Um, Even, and by the way, Nicodemus says there were others. Nicodemus says some of us... You know, so he seems to indicate he wasn't the only one. Right. Yeah. And, right. and I think that's um, important, by the way, uh, that mm -hmm. we make that distinction among the Pharisees, that not all the Pharisees are bad. We, You know, Jesus blasts uh, Pharisee thinking on uh, repeated occasions, but not all the Pharisees were bad. Um, uh, Nicodemus comes to Jesus' defense uh, outside of that conversation and talking about Jesus uh, on occasion. So it's, it, it's important for us to remember that. You know, I've always thought one of the most important things about Pharisees is that Paul doesn't say, when he's talking about being a Pharisee, he doesn't say, I used to be a Pharisee. He says, I am a Pharisee. Yeah. Um, and I've often wondered about the idea that Paul seems to still think of himself as a Pharisee, even as a Christian. So, I, you know, I've often said, you know, I'll stop short of being too um, Pharisees are evil by being because you're a Pharisee. I'll, I'll just say that some Pharisees were pretty evil. Um, yeah, my might be the way to put it. My thinking is that uh, in that context, he's only saying I wasn't a Sadducee. No, oh, yeah, and that I might be it. Yeah, and still believe in the resurrection. Yeah. And I think that is the primary distinction. I think that the dishonesty that they practice toward Jesus and uh, later toward Christians in general was not part of being a Pharisee, but part of being uh, uh, an unbeliever. Because even in Acts 15 that we've talked about, some of those converts had been Pharisees. Yeah, it says some of the sect of the Pharisees believed, who believed. Yeah. Um, and again, it sounds like it's almost a, a present tense uh, yeah. statement there in Acts 15 and verse 5. Um, kind of off track, though. We'll come back to uh, come back to John. Well, you know, there, there could be Joseph of Arimathea might have also been a Pharisee. He, he is clarified as a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews. Yeah. Yeah. I know a lot of, again, a lot of the commentators will say that they, uh, they understand by the, by the connection to Nicodemus there in John 20 or John 19, that they usually say it's, it's likely he was a Pharisee. Yeah. And it's interesting that John is the only gospel writer who mentions Nicodemus, but all four mention uh, Joseph of Arimathea. Yeah. All right. Um, so you got you made it down to verse fourteen. If I heard things correctly, uh, so thirteen, thirteen, yeah. Okay. Um, well, you want to continue reading through. Well, it's kind of lengthy from that point forward. Um. What about verse? Uh, let's see. You read through verse thirteen. Let's read verses fourteen through. Um, nineteen. Yeah. Yeah. Let's don't do a cliffhanger. That's the end, <laughs> of, that's the end of Jesus' statement, anyway, at least for the yeah. letter. Yeah, Bob, if you if you would, just keep reading there, 14 through 19. Okay. Now, about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How does this man know letters, having never studied? Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory. 
but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true and no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? Okay. You know, Brian, I can't believe they, they insulted Jesus like they did there. Um, specifically, what I'm referencing is verse 15. And Jews marveled, saying, How does this man know letters, having never studied? Did they just assume he didn't know numbers? They're not well, talking I, about the alphabet. <laughs> I, I wonder Number, if the book of numbers. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, nice. Bad joke. Yeah. <laughs> I get All it. Right, go ahead. I'm kind of slow on the uptake. Uh, <laughs> I, I wonder if this is a parallel to these other statements. So in Matthew 13 and verse 54, when Jesus is teaching, they say, "Where did this man get this wisdom?" Yeah. Uh, Mark 6 and verse 4, "Where does this man get these things and the wisdom?" Uh, that seems to be a constant statement. And by the way, that's also Jesus's disciples later. How did these fishermen figure this stuff out? Um, that they're that it that it probably is. You know, it's interesting. How does this man know letters? Um, it, it might not be meant as an in uh, as a insult, but it might be a uh, who did this guy study under? You know, who who honor is he one of? You know, you had these big uh, big big rabbis near this time. Did he studied to put in Gamaliel. Did he? You know. That the, here's a man that came out of nowhere that wasn't a student. In fact, in fact, they've researched him. We know that because they'll say he's a he's the carpenter's son, because they've they've checked him out. Yeah. And the incredible thing is, um, it would be like for us today, somebody showing up and talking about nuclear physics or um, you know some kind of uh, you know uh, uh, quantum physics. Well, where'd you go to school? Well, I just graduated high school. I didn't do you know. Really? And you know, you know, you've built this, you know, cold fusion reactor kind of a kind of conversation that he's he's saying things that outsmarts their top scholars. And so it just it just is earth shaking, you know, that you can talk to a man that can just say, ah, let's go to this place in the Bible. And, you know, I've always one of the things I've always point out is that this is a time, in fact, until the last hundred years, 150 years. Um, there, it's been this way, that you don't have an easy access to the Bible. You don't have a, oh, let me grab my Bible and open it and read for the day. You know, we we take, we read the Bible. Some of us read the Bible daily. Good for you. Uh, some of us read the Bible daily. You didn't have that opportunity in ancient yeah. times. Your only hope of getting the Bible was you got to go to the synagogue and they read it to you once a week. Um, and you may not, if if you're not a man over a certain age, you, you weren't even a part of that. You, you got to listen. So, the ability to not just, you know, have some idea of scripture, but actually to quote it is a, is a symbol of a knowledge of somebody who has studied scripture. Jesus can quote scripture, but there's no evidence he ever spent time memorizing it. He's not a scribe, you know, and yet, and the scribes are the guys that copied it down. So they have it by memory in a lot of times. Jesus outsmarts the scribes. That's, that's a big thing. I think the difference is... Uh, I know a lot of preachers uh, stress memorization. Now, there's nothing wrong with memorization, but what we need to work on is the internalization. Jesus, I don't think, had intentionally memorized simply for the sake of memorizing, but he had internalized everything. I mean, he was the God. He was part of the Godhead. He was uh, a part of the uh, the process of of, uh, of revelation and inspiration, and so. He had done this at age 12 in the temple, asking and answering questions. And the questions, I take it, were hard questions. Questions that caused them to, to scratch their heads because it says they were amazed at his answers. Uh, that's in Luke chapter uh, 2. And so uh, it's, it's no small wonder that he's still doing this uh, 18 to 20 years later. And uh, and so, yeah, he hadn't studied at the feet of anybody, but he had obviously spent time. He had spent time with his father in direct communication with him. And certainly he would have poured over his uh, the scriptures many times. Uh, again, I, I don't think necessarily because he didn't know it, any of it, but because it was a source of comfort to him. And uh, it helped him with reverence to his manhood, at least, 
to better demonstrate as a man the principles that he himself and his father had revealed. Okay. All right. Um, Brian, one side note, we were almost out of time. And like I said, uh, uh, we started, I started, I started to slate um, this morning. And so let's hold off any more discussion really of 16 and following, but let's go back to one thing you said though. Um, there was some access to the scriptures. We think about the Bereans who search the scriptures daily. Do you think maybe in that context, he's talking more about like the Septuagint? So the Septuagint, of course, is the is the Greek uh, mm-hmm. version of the Old Testament, and it seems like there was a there was a fairly easy access to that, as you mentioned. The Bereans seem to have it, um, and that statement about them searching the Scripture daily um, has a lot of connotation about what that could mean. Um, I think what what we just might not appreciate is that again, owning a Bible would have been only the privilege of the rich you know yeah. uh somebody who could afford to have a copyist copy it down you didn't you didn't have bookstores where you could go buy books and and certainly even when you could buy things that were written um in ancient in ancient history what we find is that the people that own lots of and of course they weren't bound books they were typically scrolls the people who own lots of scrolls were always rich so you know you had to, or a synagogue would have them and that's what they called the seed of moses um that's referred to in matthew chapter 23 so this idea of the access is, uh, you know, you you had access, but it wasn't easy access, and it was kind of limited. And so the idea, and I love what Bob said about the idea that Jesus Jesus has a twofold appreciation. Number one, that he knows the scriptures perfectly. Like I said, he can he can quote them. But number two, he actually understands what they mean. Um, and that's the thing that the scribes don't have. And the scribes are interesting. This is why the scribes are a big deal. Is the scribes obviously scribes are the copyists. But if I copy something 10 times, I probably have it pretty good in my mind, right? That's kind of the impression we get why the scribes were the people that were, uh, the scribes and Pharisees are one click and the priests and Sadducees are the other click. And the, the scribes and the Pharisees and the scribes are the guys that have all the knowledge. So so one of the things you always notice is when Jesus is critical of the scribes, you know, think of this particular group of people that had a knowledge of the scriptures, but maybe didn't actually know what it meant uh, or couldn't apply it. And so Jesus, what I think is fascinating is sometimes Jesus, when he's talking to scribes, he'll say, well, what do you think God means when he says this, you know? And, oh, I don't know. You know, he'll say, "What when he says, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand, what's that about? Well, I don't know. You know, we wrote it down. We've read it. We don't actually know what it means. Jesus knew what these things meant. And now what Bob said, that's, I mean, this is why, this is why the common statement all the time is we've never heard anybody talk like this. Um, and think about what that means on two levels. Number one, with authority. You know, Jesus spoke from his own authority. Uh, Matthew chapter seven hits it like that. He, this man speaks with authority. Number two, we never even heard anybody talk like this. And that's, we haven't got there yet, but in John eight, the, the, the guy's gonna walk back saying, we can't arrest this guy. We never heard anybody talk this way. Um, and, and this other idea is he, mem- he has the scriptures by heart, he also knows what they mean. And that's incredible. And, and what he said was indisputable. Hmm. It could not be disputed. Uh, Even Stephen in Acts chapter uh, 6, they could not deny the things that he was saying. They didn't like it, but they couldn't argue against it, not with any kind of rational argument. And of course, uh, unbelievers in general, but the Pharisees in particular in the first century, if you can't answer somebody intelligently, you just ridicule them. And we see this in politics all the time, as well as in That's right. Um, one one more thought, and then we'll go ahead and end it. When the new when the um, new covenant comes around, probably for the first twenty years, just on what we know, everything would have been learned by auto auditory by hearing. I mean, you know, unless they were writing letters early on and circulating the teaching. Uh, most of the teaching that people learned, as he says, faith comes by hearing. I think that'd be very literal in the beginning of the church there. And then people would have to hear and remember. And so they would likely hear it frequently and and remember it. Not counting those who had, you know, the gift of knowledge and things like that. Um, but we're not sure how long they went before they actually had 
here, carry, carry this, uh, make copies of this letter and pass it among yourselves type thing, you know. Yeah. That, but I guess Colossians says that, right? Oh, make a statement like that. To Laodicea. I want to say one more thing, and that's about the, the Jews in Berea. And keep okay. in mind, Acts 15, 11 is talking about Jews. It's not talking about Gentiles. Right. They had access to the scriptures in their synagogues. Yes. Yeah. And they heard, I mean, even uh, uh, James says in Acts chapter 15, Moses is read every Sabbath day in a synagogue. Well, they had to have the scri the scriptures there to read from. And so some of these people in Berea probably would have had access, easy access to those Old Testament documents. And didn't Paul teach in the synagogue in, in, in Berea would be the assumption? Everywhere he went. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it would be very easy for them to afterwards sit down and look up the quotes he referenced or... You know, however that was. Yeah. Okay. All righty. Well, let's plan, hopefully, all things being working properly next week. Let's plan to continue our study next week with John 7. Let's start right around verse 16. Um, because he's going to explain, you know, they question, has already been pointed out, they question, how does this man know this stuff? Because, you know, he doesn't know letters. Um, and Jesus goes and explains again, like he has said several times already, and will continue to say that what he is teaching is from the father and, um, not to discount his authority, but so they would know where the message is coming from. So we can, we'll pick up there. John seven, verse 16 next Thursday. All right. Any final thoughts or comments? All right. Appreciate your patience and tolerance with some of the issues. I appreciate Brian flying solo and picking Bob up along the way and managing it for a while. And <laughs> I didn't hear much of it because I was busy trying to fix my problem over here, but I'm sure it was a good study. All right. Well, listen, we'll see everyone next Thursday at 11 o'clock AM central time. Um, as we continue our study through the gospel of John, thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you again next week. Bye-bye.